my body's obviously saying no, and then uh, my desire to be the best version of myself I can be is saying yes. Still got work to do. I don't think God brought me out of the desert. <laughs> Let me fail right now. Um, yeah, I'm Kenny Hill. I, oh, that one. Um, I run a private practice called Recovery Hill in Sacramento, California. My plan is I'm going to run a marathon without training for it. That's my genius idea. The idea of running a marathon sounds awful. That sounds terrible. And I don't like that. And I felt all sorts of fear about it. And I naturally do this thing um, that I've worked on when I have these, these negative self-talk. I like to bring in reality thinking and, and start to question um, what is that about and is that real? If the thought is, I can't do it, there's no way I can possibly do that, that's, that's utterly ridiculous, then reality thinking is, why? What makes you think you can't do it? Do you have any experience or evidence to tell you that you can't do it? And so it's really not about trying to counter it with positive thinking necessarily, it's about being real with your thoughts and, and connected and authentic. But what I began to start doing was I started placating those feelings that felt fear. So the thoughts were, you could do it, like you could totally do it. You just would have to train for it. If you trained enough and you trained hard, you can do it. If anybody trained well and they trained hard enough, they can do something like that. And though those thoughts are real, I didn't like the way I was placating my feelings. I didn't like the way I was trying to massage these fears that I had. Okay, but you know, what if you um, ran a marathon and you didn't train for it? What if you didn't train for it? All of a sudden I was overcome by this fear. All of a sudden I was overcome, I almost sick to my stomach with the feeling of attuning to that idea. What if I ran the marathon without training? And I felt fear, I felt overcome by fear, and I couldn't shake it, I just, it stuck with me. And within about 15 minutes, I, I began to realize, I think I need to do this. I think I need, I think this is something I have to do. That's this aspect with this road, right? The avoidance of normal misery. Normal misery, you might ask is, okay, well, what's normal misery? I would say just about anything you can imagine that would be miserable is normal misery. Cancer is normal misery. Death is normal misery. Um, rejection. Somewhere along the line, we learn, okay, let's avoid that at all cost. And when we do that, we become worse as people. But I'm thinking in combination with run running this marathon without training for it, I also want to do uh, 500 push-ups in conjunction with that, which is why I'm warming up my shoulders. So roughly 20 push-ups per mile. Yeah. In my experiences um, in life, especially in the last 15 years, now I've had experiences where I've taken on challenges and uh, you know, joining the military, joining the infantry, that, that was a challenge. My resiliency and my capacity for resiliency wasn't built up enough yet to allow that experience to be what it could have been. And that's one of those things where I feel like um, maybe I towed the line, but I didn't actually give it my all and what I had in me. And a lot of my life's biggest regrets have been times where I didn't tow the line. Or maybe I towed the line and I quickly turned away from it, or I didn't even attempt it. I said, forget it, that's too scary, I'm not gonna do it. And those are the things that stick with me the most. I have other things that stick with me, but not towing the line is the thing that I now find intolerable. To kind of deepen my why, my family, and my children, um, my role as a father and husband, a big why for me is my son, Church. What does the nacho you bring? You say after or the wrestling contest. I get this scream. <laughs> <laughs> and he has medical condition that's pretty severe, and he is um, regularly in the hospital in the ER, and he's regularly getting surgeries to try to improve his condition. Because of his multiple operations, procedures, and hospital visits, he has a natural traumatic what is known as a somatic response within his body due to going to the hospital. 
The idea of going to the hospital even pulls out this sense of that is impossible, I cannot do it, there's no way. He doesn't say those words, but his tears say those words. My wife and I, we regularly have to ask him to do these things that he feels in his body that is impossible. And I do my best to try to coach him up and do some grounding with him. He does some um, grounding exercises and meditative exercises with me. And then he gets himself grounded and he does the work. He, he goes and he does the thing that he has to do. And it's, it's inspiring to me. That's one of the motivations. And this is a regular theme as a father where you're asking your children to go through experiences of failure and to live through experiences of failure as somebody who wants to try to model that life to my family um, and to my clients. Um, I think uh, I take a lot of responsibility in that act of being somebody that can uh, walk that road out. And I'm walking out to the garbage, take out the garbage the other day, and I'm having thoughts, well, nobody would know other than the people who are helping you out with this little project. You haven't told anybody. So nobody would know if you didn't finish. You could just fail and be on your way. I hate that I have those thoughts. It's similar to times when I've had thoughts early in my sobriety, in the first few years especially of my sobriety. Man, you, you can use, like, you can use, nobody would know about it. You can have a drink, you can probably have a drink, just stay away from meth, you know? And I would have these thoughts, oh, like, man, like weed, right? Like, you could, what if, what if you just smoked weed? I would have these sort of thoughts in those first three years of my sobriety that says, you can get away with it. And the greatest thing I did was shutting those thoughts up and knowing that, that that's, that's not who I am and that's not what I'm trying to be. I'm trying to be somebody that can make his family proud, somebody that can make himself proud, somebody that can make his higher power proud, his wife, and the people that I plan on serving for the remainder of my life from, from a clinical standpoint and mental health standpoint, trauma and addiction standpoint. I want to be somebody that can actually walk the walk. I think I'm going to end this thing tomorrow with um, a lot of injuries. I'm, I'm anticipating it. I have plantar fasciitis problems. I've had knee problems for years. Um, I have a right hip issue. There's so much um, rationality and saying that I shouldn't be doing what I'm doing. And so the lower back is tightening a bit, and then I, um, I was really hoping that the knees would have just kind of numbed out at this point, and they haven't, unfortunately. I'm feeling it out here, I'm feeling it out here, mostly. So, where am I at? Like 280 on the push-up? 280. Somewhere around mile 10, I had my head down just going. This was after the crash. And then I heard faintly, because I have these on, Mel say, watch out for that rattler. So I look up in front of me and there's a rattlesnake literally in front of me. Um, so of course I stopped and then, um, and it began to go off trail. I got a few pictures, but yeah. Um, so the, in biblical terms, we know what the snake means, right? And it's obviously the the Satan or the thing that doubts you or the thing that says um, what you're saying is wrong. Um, so, yeah. There is an outcome that I'm gonna be able to get from this, and I don't know exactly what the outcome is, but I really hope that there's some blind spots that I'm weak to, I can't recognize in my life, and I'm gonna see, be able to come to fruition in it. Whether it's um, me slobbering and crying on myself in the experience, or um, fully tearing this meniscus that's giving me issues, or, or something, um, and you know, something that feeds into these thoughts and these excuses in the back of my head that says, okay, now you've done enough. 
you can quit now. You can stop now. You don't have to finish. That's the stuff that those thoughts in the back of my head, that's the stuff that really sticks with me and I'm being challenged by lately because I have the other day I'm walking around and I'm like, my, my knees in particular, I've been very attuned to them in the last month and a half and they have been painful in the last month and a half because I'm paying so much attention to them. I don't want to. Come on, man. It's just the weirdest thing. I go, ooh, man, I go to stretch out. Ah. Go to stretch out one cramp and then another one shows up. Ooh. Ay. I'm going to try. Mm, come on. Yep. All right. Let's go. I'm going to walk it out. Cramps are going to go away. Cramps are really representing uh, cravings. Early sobriety, oh, man. Cravings are a son of a gun. The longer you sit on them, the longer you rest on them, they turn into obsessive thinking and those negative thoughts with the obsessive thinking makes them darn near impossible to complete and get through. Helena calls, tell her I'm doing awesome. I tell clients often, um, I want you to chase after failure. Seek it out, chase it down and run it out. Fear's pretty fast. And when you run after it, you might catch it, you'll grab it, snatch it by its ankle, yank it down, and when you catch it, the experience, it feels awful, sure, it feels terrible, no matter what. Failure feels awful. Um, you know, we all have the easy road and the hard road, right? But within this, what I'll say is you have two roads and you have one road that on the, on the road sign, it says avoidance. And the other road is uh, fear. So fear road. And when you look at avoidance road, maybe there's some nice wildflowers along the, the beginning path of that road or the beginning as, as you would turn into that road, it looks relatively clear. But if you kind of squint a little bit and you, and you look into the distance, um, not too far in the distance, you begin to see other layers or levels of fear. And, and these fears are like disguised and masked and they have halos on them in different ways. But Nonetheless, if you really look closely, these are other levels of fear. And you can then go ahead and look at the fear road. And that road has got a big, scary monster on it. And that monster is saying, don't even dare. Don't even think about it. Don't come down this path. If you do, I will reject you. I will make you feel insecure. Don't even dare do it. I just need my body to cooperate with me here. Man, the cramps are on a joke. Does the nice person come by and give me a gel? So, so here's a good metaphor. We got lost probably, I would say for me, there was about four times where I'm like, okay, which, where am I supposed to go? Um, and I think that Metaphorically, that really connects to early recovery um, in some shape or form of mental health development where you're like, okay, I've done all the right steps, and here I am at this another crossroads. I wasn't expecting this. Like the trail was, everybody says, or when I look at the trail, it's supposed to go this way. It's obvious. I just keep going, but now, well, now it's not so obvious. So I'm looking for help, and I don't have help. Okay, well, then I gotta kind of follow my intuition. Okay, maybe I go left here. I think I'm, 
But I just keep going left, how bad could that go? So. The finish line for success is much shorter than the route to catching fear and failure. Oftentimes what you'll end up doing is you'll wind up with success and you wouldn't have caught fear or failure. No matter what fear is going to overwhelm you if you choose not to play the game of tag with it. Double tap for the flex. <laughs>